Just another prayer request I neglected to mention. Uh, the last call to the pastor in Wilmington um, texted me last night and uh, said that uh, his car had been stolen. He had gone to make a visit with another member of the church. So they went in the other guy's car. When they came back, somebody had stolen his car. And I want you to be praying for him. He has had nothing but hard times uh, since he's been in this church. And uh, he's always wanted, he's always thinking he should give up, and then he comes back and does it again. But just keep him in your prayers that God would encourage him. And um, maybe God will give him a better car. Who knows, all right? But uh, just keep him in prayer. Well, let's look together, if we would, in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 12 and 13, he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The Christian life is intended to be a practical life down-to-earth life. It's not something we're always up on the clouds and always speaking in phraseology that nobody understands and we're always you know, living some experience to the next experience. But it has an impact upon our daily lives. Salvation is given as a free gift of God's grace and we cannot earn it. We, can't, we don't deserve it. But once we are saved, the new life that is ours in Christ will result in a new way of living. Okay, There will be a different way to live. You're not going to simply add Jesus to your old life. Your old life has passed away. It's going away. Things are changing, and you're becoming brand new. The Bible tells us that one way that happens is because we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we are in the Word of God and the Spirit of God is, is instructing us and helping us, that our minds are renewed and our attitudes change and our, and our thought life changes and our actions are, are changing. We're not perfect, but we're changing and we're becoming more and more like Christ. And I found that um, there are times that there's rapid growth. Have you not noticed that? That sometimes it's like you're just, man, how am I learning so much? How am I learning so much? How am I changing so much? And then there are times when it's like almost a snail crawling that you're wondering, why am I still dealing with this? I've been saved 10, 20, 30 years. Why am I still dealing with this issue in my life? But still there's change. Still there's growth. Still there's, there, there, there's the outworking of the inward work of God. Well, the two verses that are before us this morning are two verses that give people a lot of trouble. And they give people trouble simply because it seems that on the one hand, we are told we're supposed to work out our salvation, and on the other hand, we're told that God is the one working in us to accomplish his good pleasure. So which is it? Do we do the work? Does God do the work? Who's doing the work here? Well, when we look at this this morning, I want us to understand that it is, it is a continuation of what Paul has been talking about all the way through here. That Paul simply, if you'll notice in verse 12, what is the first word? Wherefore? It means in continuation, that as he has been talking about the, the consolation and the comfort of love in Christ and the fellowship, and then how Christ humbled himself and became obedient to, to the point of death, even the death of the cross, and that he is highly exalted and God has given him a name above every name, and one day every knee will bow, every tongue will, will confess that he is Lord. And so when we're coming through with that, he then says... As you have always obeyed now, as you have always obeyed and followed what he, that they have been taught, Paul then says to them, there's some things that need to happen. There needs to be the outward working of your faith. And there are two kinds of obedience. Notice he says, wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. You see, there, are, there is that obedience that's done only in the presence of others, right? There is that obedience that, that, that you only do it when other people are around. 
You know, you only read the Bible when another Christian is around who always reads the Bible. You only talk about the things of God when other people who talk about the things of God are with you. You only watch your speech. You only watch your actions only when there are others around that you think may be checking up on you. Well, here's the thing. That's a way of obedience. The Bible calls that in Colossians chapter 3, it calls that eye service. It calls that being a, a, a men pleaser. You're only doing what you think would please others. And there are a lot of people who do that. Okay? They, they profess to be saved and they may really be saved. But the thing is that they only seem to be obedient to the things of God when the other Christians are also there. When the pastor shows up. It's always amazing if I don't see somebody for a while and I go to visit them. They have a ton of Bible questions. And, and, and I'm thinking, man, if you just show up, most of these would have, would have been answered in the last month or so. But I want to point out to you, their only interest is if I come, the rest of the time they're not in the Word of God. Or when another believer comes, they will immediately begin to tell them how their life has been, how bad it's been, how many struggles they've had, and all these things, when really, if they had just been faithful to be praying and seeking the Lord, instead of just when somebody else comes. And Paul is saying, I'm in prison, okay? So you can't really wait for me to show up and make sure that you're doing the right thing. Okay? It's kind of like, Curtis, if I went on a diet, okay? And I started working out, okay? Now, that, that's a far thing in the distant future. But let's say that I did. And let's say I had you help me. And you're saying, man, Pastor, you're a mess, okay? All due respect to you, you're a mess. And so I need you to be doing this and this. You need to work out here, and I'm going to see you on this day and this day. And, and so, I, yes, yes, sir. Now, let's just say that on a day that I'm supposed to be running or something, um, you happen to drive by a park, and I'm just scarfing down a Big Mac. I'm supposed to have changed my diet. I'm supposed to have done that. Well, but when you come, I really drop the Big Mac. Oh, 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 wait a minute. You know what? I don't even know where this thing came from. It just jumped in my hands. Somebody came by here. They gave it to me. They, they made me eat this thing. And I start working out. I start running when you're there. Well, you see, that's what happens with many believers. When somebody comes along that they think they have to be accountable to, they suddenly feverishly start serving God in some way. But they're really not serving God at all. It's really not happening. It's a, it's a pretend kind of thing. Now, Notice there is the faith, that is the obedience that is done in the absence of others. This is the, 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 the right kind of obedience, isn't it? It's done to please God. It's done for conscience sake. It's not done for any other person. This type of obedience remains faithful no matter what others do or what they think about you. You just do it. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And it's this type of obedience that Paul is wanting in the lives of these in the church of Philippi. He is wanting them that even in his absence that he wants them to be faithful to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, also, this involves not only just our work, but it involves both man and God. And this is what we're looking at this morning. Man has a role to play in living the Christian life, does it not? God will not live that life for you. Okay? You have to work out your salvation. Now, notice he does not say that you are to work for your salvation. You're not working for your salvation. You're not doing things in order to be saved. You are doing them because you have been saved. The Bible is very clear that for by grace we've been saved through faith and that not of ourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot work your way to God. Now I realize I'm talking to the choir here this morning, you all know this, but many times by the way that we live, we almost act as if we believe this. I was just reading an article written by a guy, I haven't finished it yet, I didn't have time, but... But basically, his whole premise is this, is that there is a great problem 
with Catholicism in the evangelical church today. That, that people that in Baptist churches and, and, and Pentecostal churches, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever church that professes to be following Jesus Christ, there is a great problem with Catholicism. They don't call it Catholicism, but they act like it. And they do things in order to be pleasing to God. They do things in order to make sure that they are going to heaven. As a matter of fact, I have, I've asked this question in, in churches, and I've said, hey, what if you committed a terrible sin? A really rotten sin. Something that you would think right now is the worst sin anybody could ever commit. And as you left the scene of sinful crime, you walked down the road, you got in your car, you walked home, but you were run over by a bus and you were killed. What would happen to you? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? You haven't had time to confess it. You haven't had time to repent of it. You haven't had time to do anything about it. You've just committed the sin and you've gone home. Where would you go? Well, there are many people that say, well, Pastor, you'd just go to hell. But that's not what the Bible says. You see, you did not earn your salvation by what you did. You did not work for your salvation. You did not earn it by being good. You simply were saved by the grace and the mercy of God. And that grace and that mercy and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ have cleansed you and continue to cleanse you, according to 1 John 1, 7. They continue to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That does not mean that you go out in importunity and you commit sin after sin after sin. We're not talking about that. You see, but God doesn't look at your good deeds and your bad deeds, and he, he doesn't say, hey, you know what, you've done a lot of good things lately. I mean, like there was a month ago when you were really messed up, but boy, you've been on fire lately. I mean, what's happening? He doesn't do that. Because God's purpose in our lives is that he does the saving completely. We have nothing to do with our salvation. Salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. So it doesn't say we're to work for our salvation, and nor does it say that we are to somehow design our own salvation. Now, what do I mean by that? There are many people, they, they get hooked on this thing of, you know, and I've known many, many preachers growing up in a Baptist background that would always talk about, you know, you have your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And they really stress that personal relationship. And it almost became to the point where, you know, what some people do is fine and what I do is fine. We're all saved. We just have different ways of expressing our relationship and our life before God. And none of us really are the same. Well, in some respects, that may be true. God may have a burden on your heart that he may not have on mine. God may have me doing something that you think, boy, that just seems really legalistic. Well, let me tell you something about legalism before we get too into this. Legalism is not being obedient to the word of God. That's not what it means. Legalism has to do with the fact that when you do, you're, that you're trying to do something in order to add to what God says is salvation. That you're saying, not only do you trust in Jesus, but you must also keep all of the Jewish feasts. Not only do you trust in Jesus, but you must also be baptized. That becomes legalism. Not only do you trust in Jesus, but you must always wear a black suit when you come to church or a black dress. That becomes legalistic. If you've driven by some... Places of worship, you may have noticed people coming out and they seem to be dressed similarly. They seem to have the same kind of look. All the women have the same kind of hairdo. Apparently there must be a hairdresser in the church. I don't know. But they all look the same. And they all look drab and bedraggled and look like, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's a rough life for them. But that becomes a legalistic kind of thing. That if you're not like that, there's a church not far from here that they believe that men, if you wear short sleeves shirts, you're not going to heaven. Now, this is crazy stuff. 
But they take some obscure verse in the Old Testament about not bearing your arms and about, and, and, and it becomes this point of simply not just a matter of preference for somebody, but it becomes a matter of faith. That's legalism. So before you accuse somebody of being legalistic, make sure you understand what it is you're accusing them of. You're saying they're adding to the word of God and they're adding to the way of salvation by saying you must do this or not do that. No. Being obedient is what they're doing many times. Now, their obedience may be an annoyance, but let's call it what it is. But if it's obedient to the word of God and we're not doing it, it becomes our problem, not theirs. The reason why it becomes an annoyance for many people is because we're not willing to do it. You see? So, it is not to design our own salvation. Listen, there's a common side of salvation. There's a common expression that happens within the heart when a person is truly saved. Let me show you. Turn back, if you would, to Luke chapter 19 just for a moment. Luke, the 19th chapter. Luke chapter 19. Very familiar story of a little man named Zacchaeus. And, and notice what it says here. You know the story of Zacchaeus. He was a publican, a tax gatherer, and he cheated people and whatever, but he, didn't, he wanted to see Jesus. Jesus came to, to Jericho, and Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree to see him. Jesus says, come on down. And notice after their little conversation, if you'll notice in verse 8, it says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Notice what Jesus says. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Is Jesus saying that the way that you know say is that they give away all their money no but what he's saying is that there's going to be a revolutionary change within our hearts that we're not going to go back and live the way that we came before we got saved we're going to be different if we are a liar before we come to know Jesus Christ when we leave the place of worship we're not going to be a liar we're going to be careful with our speech we may still mess up, but we're going to be careful and we're going to be what? We're going to be convicted when we do. If we're a gossip, we're going to stop that. If we are always uh, uh, putting other people down, we're sarcastic. When we come to know Jesus Christ, it's going to change how we speak. It's going to change our activities. I knew a guy many, many years ago. I was still a teenager and he went to my father's church, and uh, he got saved. On, on, I remember on a Sunday morning, he came and, and gave his life to Jesus Christ, and they counseled with him and talked with him for a while. And the next Sunday, he came back, and he said, Folks, I, I just want to rejoice in what God has done. Uh, I, I, I lost my job this week because of my faith in Christ, uh, but I know that God will give me a better job. Well, people thought, my goodness, how do you lose your job? How did that happen? He said, well, I'm the manager of a liquor store. I just couldn't do it. So I walked out. I walked out last Monday. Now, wait a minute. That's being really kind of, you know, come on. You got to make a living. You got a family. I mean, you got to take care of it. I want you to know, if any man be in Christ, he is brand new. There are new desires within us. Why? Because we want to live a way that pleases him. So when he says, there is something that involves both man and God, man has a role to play in this, and his role is much different than simply planning his salvation. It's working it out. Now, there are two varying extremes in the Christian life. There is an ism in the Christian life known as quietism. Now, you may have never heard of quietism, but there's another word with a Q that you have heard of, Quaker, okay? Quakers are, are quietists, okay? And what does that mean? 
That simply means that, that a quietist, a person who is into this quietism, believes that God does everything and we are passive in the whole relationship with God. That if God wants me to do anything, he'll make it happen. If God wants me to marry somebody, then he will cause me to marry them. If God wants me to have money, then he'll give me money. If God wants me to have children, then he will just give me children. And we go on and on. Now, some of it can be true, but I want to point out to you, it becomes a very passive kind of living where there is nothing that man has to do at all. That's contrary to the word of God. I don't know if you're familiar with the writer Hannah Whittall Smith, who was a Quaker, who wrote a couple of books, and I would not recommend that you ever read them, but uh, one book entitled The Christian Secret of a Happy Life. Very classic book. And she wrote this book, and uh, basically she believed this. And one of her uh, chapters talks about how God takes us as clay, and he's the potter. You're familiar with that passage, right? And he is the potter, we're the clay, and we don't do anything. We just simply are in his hand. He shapes us, he molds us, he puts us where he wants us to be. He moves us along like a child playing with a little doll might do. And he puts us here, and he moves our hands, he does all these things. In other words, God does everything. We don't do anything. And then someone asked her, well, what about when you sin then, when a Christian sin, whose fault is that? She said, oh, that's when you, the clay, jump out of the potter's hands and roll off in a corner. Well, this is craziness. This is not of God. There's also not only quietism, which we could go longer, but we're not, okay? But there's also pietism. And pietism has to do with the fact that, guess what? Let's just say it the opposite, kind of. That it's not God doing everything, it's you doing everything in the Christian life. God does the saving, but you do all of the living. You don't really need God until you get in a jam. Then he's there for you. And you do all of these things to be holy and to be righteous. And in other words, when somebody says, we need to be more holy, you say, what is well, we need to pray more. We need to read the Bible more. We need to, in other words, there's a list of do's and don'ts that we must do in order to be holy. May I just simply tell you that when you come to know Jesus Christ, you're already holy as far as he's concerned. And there is a living of a holy life. And that's a little different. That's what we're going to get into. But as far as he's concerned, you are as saved as you're ever going to be. You are as holy as you're ever going to be. You are perfect in his eyes. Why? Because of Christ covering everything for you. Now, there are a lot of... Pietists tend to be Baptists a lot. And Assembly of God and people like that. The Methodists, early Methodists, were great pietists. Well, let's see what the Bible says here. Galatians 2.20 says what? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, but what? Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I, I live, I live how? I live, I'm living in the flesh, but I live it how? By faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is, a, there is a cooperation there, is there not? God is working, but we're also living. We're living what God has done. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. All right, we have all the promises of God, but what are we to do? We are to cleanse ourselves of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Does that mean God is not making us holy? No, it means what? We are living the life. And we'll talk about that in a minute. What, what does that really mean? Turn, if you would, to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings in the Old Testament. First Kings, 
chapter 8. If you need to use the table of contents, just do that. 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings, the eighth chapter, and we're going to look beginning in verse 55. First Kings, chapter 8. Right. Notice in verse 55 what it says. This is Solomon praying, dedicating the temple, and it says, And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. And let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night that he may that, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times, as the matter shall require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments as at this day. Do you see this? On the one hand, he is saying, he is praying that the Lord will do what? That the Lord will, will make his people to be perfect. That the Lord will perfect his people. That's what he's praying for. But at the same time, he's also saying to these people, let your heart there be perfect. You walk in his statutes and you keep his commandments. You see, there is a cooperation. Not about being saved. The only cooperation we have is what? Coming to him in faith. And he gives us the faith to come. And he gives the life to come. But in living the life, we might call this sanctification, living the Christian life in a holy manner, it is not God alone who is doing the work. He's already done it. It is you, it is me, walking in obedience to him. That's what we're to do. And people say, gosh, I just don't know why the Lord is not really, really helping me with my temper. Well, the Bible says put it away. Have you put it away? Well, the Lord is not helping me with this issue that I'm going through. What are you doing? How are you changing it? Well, the Lord is not helping me in the, you know, with problems with my old friends and my old life. Uh, stop going around with them. Stop hanging out. You will fail every time. Well, if the Lord wants me to, to fail or to not fail, then he'll keep those friends from me. No, you stay away from them. You see, there is much that you and I need to be involved in. Turn, if you would, very quickly to Colossians chapter 3. If you found Philippians, just turn to the next book, Colossians chapter 3. Here it is in great detail. Colossians, the third chapter. And notice this wonderful passage that begins this great way. It says in verse 1, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For what? Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Well, then how do we, how, if we're dead, how do we seek things above? How do we set our affection on things above? How do we do that if we're dead and we're already in Christ? Well, because there's the practical way of living this out. And notice what he says. It says in verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. 
Mortify therefore, because of that, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He goes on in verse, verse 7, put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. He goes on then, and now he's talking about the... The, uh, the negative things we put off, but what is he saying in verse 12? Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Do, do you see this? That our life is in Christ. We are dead to the old man. Life now is in Christ, but yet what? We are to do some seeking and some setting and some mortifying and some putting off and some putting on. God doesn't do that. We do that. One more illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians nine beginning in verse twenty seven. Twenty four. In verse twenty four. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Is there something for us to do? Yes. Run that you may obtain. Well, God wants me to obtain, then he'll move me along. Run, that you may obtain. And then he says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, I don't think that Paul was talking about being a member of some health club there, but what is he saying? He is saying, listen, I'm in a race. I've got to strive. I've got to run hard to win. It's a race of life. And I keep under myself, I keep under my body, I discipline, I buffet, I don't treat myself with all this tender care. I'm in a race. And what do we find? He runs the race and he gets to the finish line. Paul entered into heaven one day after having his head chopped off. But I want to point out to you that Paul disciplined himself. You see, there is something for us to do. Many times I've heard people say, well, if God wanted me to do this, then he would make it happen. No. No. One of the things I hear sometimes, and we all struggle because none of us are rich in here, and if you are, I want to talk to you, but we all struggle some days we, we, we have, you know, we're okay, you know. You know, we kind of look at it through, through middle class eye, lower middle class, you know, eyes. And we look at some, I'm okay, man. Got an extra hundred bucks. I'm, I'm, I'm rolling now. Well, here's the thing. There are some people, and I've heard them say this. Well, if God wanted me to have money, he would just give it to me. No. The Bible says the way you gain wealth is you work and you save and you give. That's how you do it. You know, isn't it amazing how the world has picked up on that? They work hard. They give money away. They save money. And guess what? They have it. Now, how did that happen? I guess God wanted them to have it. Or God simply set things in motion when he created the world and said, work and you're going to receive the fruit of your labors. You know what, when, I, when people tell me that, you know what I feel like? I do say this sometimes. There's a whole book written just for you. It's called the book of Proverbs. Pay attention carefully to where it says sloth and slothfulness. 
and change. Change. Well, Pastor, there are people in other countries, and there are people in this country that are really struggling, and I'm not saying anything about that, because sometimes that is true. But I've also seen people in dire circumstances, there was no hope for them at all, and they came out of it. Why? Because they became obedient to God, and they simply did it God's way. Now, let's go back to Philippians 2. Notice what he says. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? We must, we can't be helpless. We can't be totally passive. We must have fear and trembling in working out this salvation. Do you live before the Lord in fear and trembling as to how you live your life? There's a lot of carelessness that goes on among Christians today in our modern world. They only think about God on Sunday when they happen to drop in. But any other time, they live very careless, very haphazard kinds of lives. They hang out with ungodly friends. They go places they shouldn't be going. They're involved in activities they shouldn't be involved in. They are living their lives very carelessly. They're not seeking the Lord and seeking His will they're not living lives of fear and trembling. Now, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, is it not? The beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord, the Bible tells us, will give you a longer life. The fear of the Lord will give you strong confidence. The fear of the Lord will, will help you to depart from evil. The fear of the Lord will lead to a, a satisfying life in Him. It will spare you from evil. And the Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the way to riches and honor. You see, we're to fear God. And so what do we mean by this? We, it means that we're to live a careful life. That when it says, work out yourself in, in fear and trembling, that means what? That means I need to know what God wants for me. I need to know his word. I need not to be so careless about what I read and say, oh, well, I'm just praying God will help me in this. Do it. You see, here's the thing. You do not have to ask God to help you what he's already commanded you to do. Just do it. Does that make sense? If I tell one of my children when they were younger, go out and rake the leaves. Now, I might, as an act of generous mercy and kindness, I might go out and help them. But my purpose is that they go do it. They don't need to ask for my help. They have a rake. I've given them enough help. Here's a rake. Here are leaves. Here's a bag. Fill it up. When God tells us to love our enemies, we do not need to say, oh God, will you, just, will you just help me to love this enemy? Because what we're really asking at that point is we're saying, will you make this enemy more lovable? God says, love them. Pray for those who abuse you. You see, it is not about simply asking God to help us all the time with things that he told us. Now, he's always there helping us, and I'm going to show you in a minute how he is. But when he says to do it, that means go do it. Work it out. Working out what happened within us. Notice in verse 13. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Isn't God helping you? God is working in you. He says, go and work out your own salvation because it's God who is working in you. God is working in you both to do what? Both to will and to do. He says, you go do it, and all of a sudden, what do you discover? There's a power there. There's an ability there. There is a willingness there where there wasn't one before. Why? Because God himself is in you, working in you, and he's enabling you to do that. The Spirit of God is there to help you, to do what God would have you to be doing. See, we're never alone. 
in our efforts to serve God. God is always there to help us to do what he is already working in us to do. God changes our desire to will. You see, there are many times the problem is not so much with anything else except our will. Our willingness to do something. Our willingness to change. When somebody says, I can never forgive that person for what they've done. That's not true. I will not forgive that person. It's a will situation. I could never go out and witness to people. It's a will situation. You see, we need to understand that God is working to will and to do. He is, he is there working within us. And he's there helping us. So what are we doing? When we're working our salvation, what are we doing? We're offering ourselves to him. We're saying, Lord, here I am. I want to be obedient to you in this area. I'm going to go do this. And let me show you what God does. When he saves us, what does he do? Philippians 1.6 says what? That he is going to complete in us what he started. Who's going to complete the salvation? Is it us? No, it's God. It is God who, Ephesians 3 tells us in Philippians 4, tells us that he gives us the strength to do. It is the grace of God, according to 1 Corinthians 15, that enables us to be obedient to the Lord. The problem is that many Christians today have such a lukewarm attitude or lack of faith in God that they just won't do it. So let me show you one final passage, and I'll show you how this all works together. Look in 2 Peter, just for a moment. 2 Peter. Second Peter, chapter 1. And look in verse 3. Notice he says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, what has God given to us? When you are saved, what has God given to us? He's given you everything you need to live the life that he's called you to. He's given you all things that be from his divine power. It says he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. But where do those things become more active? Through the knowledge of him. In other words, what has God given to us to help us to live? He's given us his word. The more that we start to know about God, guess what? The spirit of God is within us saying, yeah, yeah that's what we need to know. Listen, he's given us everything we need to live a godly, holy life. And he's given us promises to claim. Do you understand that? Promises to claim. Because we are to be partakers of his divine nature. That doesn't make us gods, little gods. Doesn't mean we're going to get a planet one day. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. It just simply means we are part of his divine nature. Why? Because we have been born again of God. We belong to him. And because he's given us that, everything we need to live the life, to work out our salvation, is already in us. So what does he say in verse 5? And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You will not find another passage in scripture that explains it this way. It's a tremendous thing because what are we seeing? God has given us everything we need. God has given us the ability to know him. God has given us his divine nature that we might partake of. God has given us everything we need to live a Christian godly life here on this planet as long as he wants us to be here. There's no more I can't do it so hard. I just am so weak. I just can't do this. God has given you everything you need. Now what he says to do, because you have those things, add to your faith. 
Add to your faith what? Virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. Add those things to your living. By what? By faithful obedience to God. Jesus is walking on the water. Peter says, Lord, bid me to come to thee. Come on, Peter. And what does Peter do? Does he, does he look? Does he read a science book? Does he say, that's impossible? He just steps in the water. Now, I don't know how far he walked. Because people always like to get on Peter, but, you know, I've never walked on the water. I mean, he did. It was only when he got his eyes off of the Savior and he looked down at the sea that he began to sink. Why? Because we're not to look at any other thing except him. You understand? You work it out through faithful obedience to God. What God says, you do. Do you understand? What God says, you do. There are many people that have problems with their temper. I may be speaking to some here this morning. You may have a problem with your temper. You may have had a problem with that for a long, long time. Well, you've been disobedient for a long time. Because the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You get angry with somebody, God says, deal with it that very day. You know, when you go to the south, you'll see some churches. I don't know if you ever go to the south, but if you do, some of you are from there, you might realize what I'm saying. You go to the south, and you, even the Midwest, you'll have churches that have their own little cemeteries. You've seen those? Little cemeteries outside the church. And it's amazing, in many of them, not all, but in many of them, people will be buried. They'll be buried by family groups like they are. They'll be buried. Some of the Smiths will be here, the Jones over here back in this. But if you go inside that church, that's how they sit too. Smiths sit here. Joneses sit there. They sit and they're buried like they sat. Why? Because they don't like each other. Parents have thought a Jones should ever sit with a Smith. You know why we have such difficulty with other people in our Christian life? Why we are why, why we are failures at that? Why we never seem to have victory in certain areas is because we will not be obedient to what God said. We're waiting for a feeling to come. We're waiting for a kick in the rear end to do it. We're waiting for whatever. But it's not going to happen until we step out and do it and God then is working in us to accomplish what he, prom what he promised to do. You want to live a victorious Christian life? Start living now. Be obedient now. Don't wait for a feeling. Don't wait till you know more. Live it now. Live as victorious as you possibly can now. You have an area of weakness, a sin in your life. Stop sinning now. And God will enable you to go another day with it. Another day. Another day. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I what? That I may not sin against God. That word may doesn't mean, it means it might happen, it might not happen. No. It is a word that means when you take God's word in and memorize it, God will enable you to have victory over temptation and sin. That's how powerful God is. If you don't try, if you don't believe me, try this. Next time you're tempted, start quoting scripture that you know. And guess what? You'll suddenly have strength you didn't think you had, and you'll walk away from it. Why? Because God is there in you working to accomplish, to both to do, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's how it works. And thank God for making it easy for us. <laughs> Now we just got to work at it, don't we? Let's stand together as we pray. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this day. We thank you for the privilege we have of being your children. And Lord, of your word that is given to us. And Lord, we, we have it and we can read it and we can know you and we can grow strong in the things of God. Help our church, Father. 
Lord, I realize that there are many that struggle in so many ways. I pray you'd help them to take what they heard today and run with that and begin to live faithfully for thee. Bless us now as we go. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.